Greetings. My name is Patrick Dean, and I am an application engineer here at Applied Industrial Technologies. Um, I've been working uh, with Applied for some years now, developing electronic control systems for mobile equipment as well as industrial equipment. Um, before that, I worked at Case New Holland, um, designing control systems for off-road equipment. And before that, at Caterpillar, doing the same type of work. Um, I'd like to talk today about uh, electronic control systems, um, what comprises them, what makes them tick, and try and get everyone more familiar with the concepts and, uh, and jargon uh, therein. So today we'll go over um, what is and you know, what makes up an electronic control system. Um, what are the basic components of it and how everything works together. Um, we'll go through piece by piece uh, every bit of an electronic system um, from the CAN bus that ties everything together to the individual components that talk over that CAN bus. So what is an electronic control system? Well, it's a, it's most basic. It's a group of electronic components that are all working together to uh, automate or improve a uh, customer's machine. Um, today, a lot of machines are manually controlled or with some uh, very simple um, analog electronic controls, but uh, an electronic control system can help to improve upon that functionality and unlock advanced features that aren't uh, available or possible with a lot of today's machines. Uh, like a lot of Mechanical systems today, um, an electronic system isn't necessarily supplied by one vendor for all components. You may have a display from one vendor, a PLC from another vendor, sensors from yet another. Um, and like a mechanical system, all of these components need to work well with one another um, because it's uh, the easiest way to implement for the customer to be able to shop around and find the components that work best for, for their machine, for their system. And so like those same mechanical pieces, um, everything must be chosen based on the capability and compatibility with everything else in this system. For an electronic system, uh, we need to know what, uh, what voltage we're running, whether that's a 12 volt system or a 24 volt system. We need to know whether our outputs have adequate current capacity. Um, whether we have enough inputs and outputs to control everything that's needed in the system, um, what CAN bus protocol we're running. In the U.S., North America, generally it's going to be the J1939 protocol. Uh, internationally and in a lot of industrial systems, you'll see the CAN open protocol primarily being used. Um, and finally, uh, like anything that's put off-road, uh, does it have the proper environmental rating? Um, you know, is able to withstand the wear and tear of a uh, mobile application. So this is uh, intending to show sort of all of the individual components of an electronic control system uh, from a high level. Um, you've probably heard of all these individual components before, maybe even seen them on pieces of equipment. Um, we have a at the top center, we have the HMI, uh, the display that our uh, operator is generally going to be interacting with. It's going to be giving him information about the machine. And at the bottom center, you see the PLC, sometimes called the ECU or the controller. And that's generally what's going to be making all the decisions on the machine. That's where our, our software is going to be running. Um, that's how we're going to be actually controlling the machine. And off to the right, you'll see inputs and outputs. Uh, these are the, 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 where the rubber meets the road, per se, um, where we're actually getting information into our system, as well as driving commands and actually getting information out of the system to, to execute activities. And on the left, we have uh, something that um, is becoming much more um, interesting for for customers nowadays and that's telematics that's being able to to see the machine to interact with the machine whenever we're not nearby and running down the center of this entire system 
is the CAN bus. The CAN bus is the network that ties together all of these pieces of equipment and allows them to talk to each other and work together. The CAN bus, or sometimes generally just called CAN, is just a method for electronic devices to talk to each other. Um, they send messages across this network. It's a two-wire network. Um, and these messages consist of ones and zeros, like, like any sort of computer network. Um, for a good example, uh, an older style analog joystick, like you've probably seen on a lot of pieces of equipment, um, instead of communicating over a CAN bus network or a network at all, um, it sends out a continuous voltage or current signal uh, that indicates what its position is. Um, it may send out a, a signal of 1.8 volts. And if we go back to the spec sheet for that joystick, we know that 1.8 volts means it's sitting at about 25 degrees, give or take. Well, a CAN joystick differs in that by not sending out a continuous reading of what's going on, but instead sending out a series of messages, um, often hundreds of times a second, uh, indicating the, the state of the joystick. So this might include its position in, in, in multiple axes, more than likely, um, where the joystick is in the x-axis, the y-axis, or even a third axis sometimes. Um, if there's any sort of buttons or triggers on the joystick, um, the joystick can also send out CAN bus messages that state, you know, button one has been pressed, trigger two has been pressed. Um, and also, uh, like all J1939 or all CAN bus devices, um, it can also send out any joystick or any faults it's currently experiencing. So if the joystick has discovered um, that it has a uh, faulty position sensor or a button is no longer reporting in um, or if it's lost communication it can um, send out a message that indicates what those faults currently are and allow the rest of the control system to take action. Down at the bottom I sort of show a real quick visual example of an analog joystick on the left and sort of how uh, its continuous signal might look um, as you move the joystick away from neutral you get that linear increase in voltage whereas on the right side um, you're seeing that same uh, piece of information sent over the CAN bus as a series of ones and zeros. So joysticks are a, a good example of ways to um, improve system reliability and um, system uh, simplification using CAN bus, but any sort of analog wiring uh, can be improved by switching to, to a CAN network. Um, on the left, you'll see uh, four general analog sensors. Well, let's say they're pressure sensors. Well, uh, a zero to five volt pressure sensor is a three wire connection, uh, a zero volt reference, a five volt uh, source and then the signal coming back. So that's for four sensors, that's 12 separate wires being run out. Um, none of those sensors have diagnostics. If they're out of range, um, if they uh, drop a wire, um, they have no way to tell you and it's up to your controller to figure out based on the signals coming back what might be the issue. Um, however, on a CAN bus system, um, we have one wiring connection per uh, sensor. It's going to be a, a multi-conductor cable with, uh, let's say, an M12 connection or a Deutsch connection, um, plugs into the sensor itself, and then that sensor plugs into the CAN network, which then the controller is able to read. So instead of having 12 connection points now that could wiggle loose or become severed, now we have four connection points. Um, if any one of these sensors experiences a fault or experiences some sort of issue, it can send a message out over the CAN bus saying, hey, I'm pressure sensor number three, and um, the measurement unit inside of me is, uh, is out of range, and I need to uh, be serviced. 
So CAN seems like uh, sort of an advanced technology compared to what we're used to seeing, but uh, in reality, um, you're dealing with CAN systems every day. Anytime you hop into a into an automobile, um, you're dealing with a CAN system. Um, every modern uh, car uses this sort of technology, um, and the reason for that is in uh, in an automobile there are many different controllers, uh, many different um, points of control, depending on what system uh, is, is, is being used. So um, your ABS controller versus your engine controller versus your transmission controller. Um, these aren't in one big controller under the hood. It's generally a distributed system to where um, all of these are in separate control units um, spread throughout the machine or spread throughout the, the car. And they're communicating with each other over this central CAN bus, over this CAN network, um, so that uh, the, um, the transmission controller that knows how fast the car is going sends a message up to the dashboard. The dashboard shows you how fast you're going. Um, your uh, um, ABS system um, is communicating back with your transmission controller. Um, the transmission knows how fast it thinks you should be going. The ABS system decides, well, I'm slowing down too quickly. That must mean I need to engage anti-lock braking. So all these things are constantly talking to each other over this CAN network, and that allows them all to work together without having to create this, you know, colossal uh, single point of failure um, control system. Um, and like we mentioned before, uh, all of these controllers are sending messages back and forth, messages that, that both sides understand, uh, the sending side and the receiving side. Um, and these messages are um, discrete and they contain very specific information. Um, so the, uh, you know, one type of message may be purely, may be purely informational. You know, what is the speed of the, of the car? What is the coolant temperature? What, um, you know, how hard is the, is the throttle pedal being pushed down? Um, you could also have settings being sent back and forth, um, you know, from your infotainment system or your current cruise control setting. Um, and again, like we mentioned before, with the pressure sensors and and joystick, um, we can send uh, fault messages back and forth. That's very common on automobiles, and you've probably seen one in your life. That's that little uh, annoying check engine light that pops up on screen. Well, that check engine light is a CAN bus message that is being sent out by one of the controllers alerting you to an issue in your car. So in, uh, in the U.S., I'd mentioned that um, generally J1939 is going to be our, our standard for CAN communication. It's an SAE standard. Um, a lot of the uh, big manufacturers got together and came up with a standard of, um, of prescribed messages that help describe everything that can go on on a, an off-road piece of equipment. Um, so there is a standard message for um, an engine, a diesel engine, to tell you what its engine speed is. And there is a standard message for a, a multi-gear transmission to state um, what the drive shaft speed is. And all of these standard messages are included in this massive, massive uh, J1939 document that was developed. Um, so because it is a standard, um, it makes it much, much easier for us to create a control system that operates off of the J1939 protocol. Um, in fact, on every machine in the in the US in North America that uses a tier four engine, which is nearly everything nowadays, um, it is a requirement that they have a J1939 protocol CAN bus running. That's how they handle all their missions. Um, so if you have a machine that you're working with that is a tier four machine, um, you don't need to worry about um, creating a CAN bus or or you know um, you know, getting one put together from scratch, it's already running on the machine. Um, the engine is already spitting out all this information about itself and in many cases is ready to be commanded over CAN bus as well. 
Um, in the bottom here, I sort of show a, a, a visual representation of what one of these messages actually looks like for anyone interested. Um, it's fairly simple. You have a, a, a large identifier at the beginning of the message. Um, that identifier contains um, uh, the address of who's sending the message out, what the, the message ID number is, what the priority of the message is. Um, if it's a fairly high priority message, like an engine speed command, that's going to be very high. If it's a low message, um, like a, uh, a, a nuisance fault in the air conditioning system, that's going to be a fairly low priority message. Um, the rest of the message, the other 64 bits of information, are generally divided up into eight data bytes. A byte contains eight bits, so therefore we get 64 total bits, and that's where all of the actual information resides. Um, the engine speeds, the um, which gear the transmission is in, what the coolant temperature is, all that information is going to be contained inside of those eight data bytes um, in a manner which is described in that J1939 standard. So I mentioned before that the J1939 standard is exhaustive for off-road equipment. There are hundreds of standard J1939 messages summarizing everything from after treatment systems to um, transmission controls to ABS systems. Um, so for, for example, um, one of our PLCs may be able to control an engine by uh, going to the J1939 standard, locating the engine uh, control message, and then populating that message with the correct information for telling the engine to run at the speed that we uh, that we desire. Um, you know, maybe we have a, a machine that when it starts up, we want it to idle at 900 RPM, and then once the machine's warmed up, we want to bring it up to uh, 1800 RPM for operating throughout the day. So we send a CAN bus message that tells it, okay, we're ready to go to 1800 RPM. We populate the correct bytes in that message and we send it onto the engine. It listens to us and it goes up to 1800 RPM and it's ready to work. Um, even though there is this uh, standard list of J1939 messages um, that again describe you know, everything physical that can go on on an off-road piece of equipment, um, our own PLCs and displays can actually write their own messages, their own proprietary messages to send back and forth um, for things that um, are unique to our application. I um, mean, we have a harvesting application and we want to send information about what rate we're harvesting, or maybe I have um, a handful of generic pressure sensors spread throughout the system and I want to send that information up to the display for the operator to see. Well, those aren't necessarily standard J1939 messages, but um, we can use that same J1939 structure and we can send whatever information we'd like out over the bus. And any system that is set up to listen for those messages can read the messages in and, uh, and react accordingly. The next thing I'd like to discuss after the CAN bus would be a lot of what we've been discussing already, the PLC or the, the controller. Um, goes by a lot of different names, uh, microcontroller, uh, ECU, um, PLC for folks that may maybe more from an industrial background. Um, but really, again, it's the brains of the control system. It's where all the decisions are made. Um, it's where all the logic lies um, for the most part. Um, it's running our own custom software um, where we are working with the customer to develop a list of what the machine needs to do, and then we write the software to be able to accomplish that. Um, PLCs communicate with other uh, items in the system over CAN bus, like we just discussed, um, and uh, mobile PLCs, um, which is what I'm, what I'm showing on screen here, mobile PLCs, uh, unlike industrial PLCs, tend to read inputs and uh, control outputs directly, meaning that sensors uh, are wired directly to the PLC um, and outputs are driven directly from the PLC. So valves, motors, lights, things like that. Um, at a very basic level, uh, a PLC is a piece of equipment that executes tasks. 
we tell it to do a list of things. And once it finishes our list, it goes right back to the beginning and it starts the list over again. Um, from a high level, uh, this list of tasks consists of reading inputs. So whether that's uh, physical inputs like sensors or joysticks, things like that, or those inputs could be CAN bus messages. Um, uh, the engine is trying to tell the PLC something or the display is trying to tell the PLC something. Um, next, it will check for faults. It will see if a uh, temperature is out of range or if the operator has pressed the E stop um, or if the operator is trying to do something that's not currently allowed. Those are sorts of faults that we can check for. Um, once it's checked, checked for those faults, it will execute logic uh, based on whatever the current situation is. Uh, maybe the operator sent a command to um, switch gears or to accelerate or to um, pause working or something like that. So it'll execute that logic next. Um, once it does so, then it will command whatever the physical outputs are. So uh, valve coils, motors, um, whatever needs to be turned on or turned off based on the logic it's executing. And then it'll finally send out CAN bus messages to anything that is listening to the PLC, such as a display or the engine, or maybe a transmission controller. Um, and then once it sends out those CAN bus messages, it goes right back to the beginning of the list and it starts over at step one. Now, these are not um, standard tasks or standard operations of the PLC. Um, these are not necessarily just drag and drop items that the PLC executes. Uh, what I'm describing here on screen is really um, the way we organize our software. Um, so we would go in and write software that would read the inputs, write software that would check for faults and then execute the logic. Um, so again, a lot of care needs to be taken to work with customers to make sure that whatever the, um, whatever the needs of the machine are um, can be met and that's that's what we write the software around so the software that's running on the plc um, can look uh, very different depending on um, what the software package is who the programmer is um, so some different examples of software you might see would be ladder logic you know fairly common in industrial systems and um, you know, reads kind of like an electrical schematic. It, you can see it on the on the bottom of the slide there. Um, C is another very uh, very common, very popular PLC programming language, um, still used heavily today in many many applications, even though it's um, you know fairly old. Uh, structured text, which is sort of a more um, easy to use version of C, and it's uh, specific to an IEC standard. Um, flowchart is another one, a more uh, graphical type language. You see this on um, some of the more um, uh, some of the more user friendly um, software development kits. Um, software in general is going to be written to create functionality um, and satisfy requirements uh, that we discuss with our customers. Um, so when we um, when we as uh, account managers, as 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 engineers, um, start to work with a customer, we start to assemble a statement of work with them that says that these are the functions that the machine needs to have. Um, these this is how the machine needs to uh, react in different situations. And then from that statement of work, we hand that over to the software to the, our software team, and they start to write the software around those requirements. Um, software can be extremely simple. We, you know, we've made systems that are just simply fan speed controllers. Temperature goes up, fan speed goes up. Temperature goes down, fan speed goes down. Um, or even something as simple as a motor start-stop circuit. If the start button is pressed, the motor is on. If the stop button is pressed, the motor is off. If the e-stop is pressed, the motor stays off. Um, but we can also get extremely complex with software. Um, we can do full-blown uh, uh, drive systems for um, transmission control, for hydrostatics, uh, steering systems, um, 
uh, redundant steering systems, uh, work functions for loaders and um, blade type machines, um, engine management so we can control engine loads and and power management, torque management of uh, of diesel engines. So we can get fairly complex um, and uh, take a lot of these different modules and sort of put them into the same piece of software uh, based on what we uh, what we already have experience with from previous projects. I mentioned before that that mobile PLCs uh, generally have their physical I/O built into them. For industrial PLCs, you'll usually see the PLC as a standalone item, and then uh, an I.O. gateway or an I.O. bridge will be uh, handling all of your inputs and outputs, and then those two things will communicate with each other. But for a mobile system, it's critical that you select the right PLC for the amount of inputs and outputs you have. Um, most PLC manufacturers will have uh, a lineup of controllers that uh, generally increase in size and cost as you add more I.O. to them. Um, or you may find some vendors that will have a, a basic PLC with a certain amount of, of inputs and outputs onto it, and then they'll uh, provide expansion modules that communicate with the master um, PLC over, over CAN bus. The next item to discuss here would be displays. Um, displays are critical for um, communicating effectively with the operator. Um, you know, they're generally going to be the the main touch point for the operator outside of maybe um, a joystick or a or a button panel. Um, so you need to make really sure that your display interface is uh, is clear and uh, concise, not too busy or, you know, laden down with, uh, with uh, unnecessary information. Um, you know, we use uh, graphics and text to try and get the information across to the operator. Um, again, as, as simply as possible to, uh, to be able to, um, you know, not bother or distract the operator while he is, is obviously doing other things. Um, the operator's main mode of getting information into the system is going to be from the display. So whether that's on-screen buttons, um, sliders, text entry fields, um, toggle switches, and, and anything um, that you can animate on the screen, generally that's going to be the way that the, uh, the operator is going to get information into the control system about what he wants from the machine at that moment. Um, and kind of like the PLCs that we discussed before, uh, there are uh, different ways to develop software for displays. Um, again, we are we are um, designing these interfaces from scratch a lot of times, um, sometimes from templates, but generally based on what the customer wants, um, we will make sure that. Uh, we don't have any sort of superfluous information or, or anything on there that uh, that the customer doesn't absolutely need. Um, and we have tools that go from uh, very uh, basic and rudimentary. Um, again, like uh, like you may see on an industrial control system where it's really meant to convey just immediate basic amounts of information, all the way up to very high fidelity um, uh um, high resolution graphics like you may see on the uh, dashboard of a production machine, like a production automobile. Um, so we can kind of run the full gamut there. It really just depends on what the customer wants. And again, it's critical to uh, work early on with them to understand their requirements and their expectations of the of the display and, and because of how critical it is to their uh, to to their exposure to the to the operator. Um, I have a note here, you know, some displays can also be programmed with um, with control software. Um, that's uh, something that we something that we don't necessarily do in every project. Um, but it is it is good to know that um, if it is a project that does not have a need for a, a high power fast PLC and just some very simple 
um, software logic is all that's needed. Sometimes you can offload that to the uh, to the display to, to the HMI um, and uh, and remove the PLC as, as a requirement entirely. The next thing to go over would be our our input devices, similar to displays. You know, these are the method for operators to get information into the system about what they want to be happening right now. Um, or in terms of sensors, um, a way for the system to tell us what is currently happening. Um, you know, sensors would be something I would consider like a, a continuous analog signal, um, like, you know, pressure, temperature, uh, flow rate. Um, whereas a, a switch, sometimes you'll hear that a differentiation between a, a sensor versus a switch. A switch just gives you a discrete yes no um, on off type uh, bit of information so push buttons uh, proximity switches pressure switches um, a uh, a pressure sensor might tell you um, that a cylinder is at 1525 psi right um, and a pressure switch that has a thousand psi setting could only tell you whether the pressure in the cylinder is above a thousand psi or below a thousand psi. If it was 1525 or 1600 or 10,000 psi, it wouldn't know the difference. Um, joysticks are, uh, like I mentioned before, a, a critical uh, a critical element for operators to get information to the system. Um, with them being a touch point. Uh, physical touch point for the operator, you find a lot of uh, sensitivity uh, for the operator about what feels good, um, you know, joystick placement, joystick feel, joystick quality. Now, these are things we really focus on because um, it doesn't take uh, too many um, cheap joysticks being put into, uh, into um, operator cabs um, before people start thinking that the control system is cheap. So, we really like to focus on um, high quality, robust touch points um, because they make a huge difference in operators' perception of machines. Um, you know, I, I emphasize robustness there as well because um, a lot of times a uh, uh, um, lower quality um, products like this uh, just can't survive the environment. Um, you know, an operator is just a little rougher than normal. Uh, may damage it to the point where it's not operable anymore, and that's a huge, huge problem for these machines, these high productivity machines. Um, and in all of these uh, input devices, um, you probably remember from earlier in the in, in the webinar, but we can have both the analog version where it's sending out continuous signals, or we can have CAN bus versions where it's sending out messages about what's currently going on. Um, so every pressure sensor, joystick, pedal, um, flow rate sensor, all of these things have CAN bus counterparts um, compared to the, the analog version that you may be uh, more familiar with. Now, even if there is not a, a CAN bus counterpart or, you know, sometimes uh, what you'll end up seeing is uh, the CAN bus version of a sensor or of a joystick is um, more expensive than anticipated. Um, if a pressure sensor costs $50, but the CAN bus version of the pressure sensor costs $100, well, then you're probably going to um, look pretty hard at, at why I should be spending twice as much money on, um, on something that's still just telling me what the pressure in the cylinder is. So in a situation like this, um, you can consider using what we call a multiplexer. And a multiplexer is basically a way to take a handful of analog or digital signals, digitize those signals to put them on a CAN bus, and communicate them to the PLC. So let's say you have a cluster of pressure sensors in the rear of the machine, all the way in the back, but your PLC is located in the front of the machine. Well, do you want to run 12 wires all the way to the back of the machine? to uh, be able to read those four pressure sensors and run the risk of one of those wires being pinched or or um, or not terminated correctly? 
Well, you could put a multiplexer right next to those four pressure transducers. That multiplexer will supply the necessary wiring to those analog transducers and then send the information from those transducers via that two-wire CAN bus connection back to the PLC in the front of the machine. So now I'm only worrying about two wires and their integrity making it across the machine instead of 12. So we found a lot of success in larger machines that have a, a distributed architecture um, with things like multiplexers. The next thing, the counterpart to the input devices would of course be the output devices. And, and really there's two main types of output devices. Um, at least when referring to, to CAN bus controlled output devices. You have digital output devices and proportional output devices. Um, you know, both of these uh, are uh, similar to uh, to the way a PLC works um, in that they selectively uh, turn on and off uh, uh, physical outputs. The difference would be that unlike a PLC, they're not generally programmed. Um, they are uh, listening devices, as it were. So a digital output module would be uh, sometimes described as a relay bank. Um, it's a bunch of fuses and uh, relays inside of a box. Um, this box listens over the CAN bus for a specific message that tells it to turn on or off these relays. Um, so maybe a, a specific message uh, says, you know, turn on relay 2 and turn off relay 8. And it hears that message and it does so. Well, this device also um, has uh, fuses inside of it to protect those outputs that's turning on and off. And uh, this device can send um, fault messages back out over the CAN bus that say, hey, um, fuse 12 has blown or fuse 13 has blown. Um, and then the PLC can receive that message and notify the operator, hey, you've got blown fuses back in the output module in the rear of the machine. Here's which fuses they are. Please go service them. Uh, the other type of device would be the, the proportional output device that I mentioned. Um, and instead of just turning outputs on and off with, uh, with, a, um, with, with a relay, uh, it's instead um, controlling devices with proportional current by ramping current up or ramping current down. This can be really effective in controlling uh, higher inertial loads like motors and, and things like that, where if you just turned a relay on, you would get a massive rush of, uh, of current going to that while the motor started to wind up. But if you can slowly ramp that current up, you get much better, um, much better response, much more robust system um, with, uh, with um, smaller conductors as well. Now, uh, these devices generally are not built with fuses inside. Instead, since they're controlling the current themselves, they merely monitor whether or not the current exceeds uh, whatever its maximum value would be for that output. And if it does exceed it, it will turn the output off and it will send a message back to the PLC stating that there's been a fault on output number seven. So the final thing to discuss today would be uh, telematics. Uh, this is becoming much more popular in today's off-road equipment. Um, you know, perhaps uh, 10 years ago, telematics was um, not nearly as uh, popular as it is today. Um, you know, a lot of that has become uh, from uh, cellular data plans becoming much more um, reasonable in price. So if you go back to 10, 15, 20 years ago, if you had a telematics device on your machine, you know, you may be paying, uh, you know, 50 or $60 a month just to be able to see information off of that machine. Well, now that number is considerably lower, uh, especially if you have um, a, a, a fleet of machines and you're, you're, looking at, at, at maybe a dozen machines versus just the one machine. So um, that's that's been a, 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 a big way to get fleet management and, and telematics in general in many more machines. Uh, but, but you know, what is, what is telematics? What does telematics do for us? Uh, 
really what it does is it allows customers to access the machines without needing to be near the machine, without needing to physically be there. Um, and all the the things that a customer would be able to do next to the machine, they can now do from the comfort of their own office, their own home. So uh, what could those benefits be? Uh, you know, fleet management is, is a big one. You know, where are my vehicles? I've got, you know, a fleet of 30 garbage trucks. You know, let me look on this uh, Google map um, and let me see a, immediately where all 30 of my garbage trucks are. Um, you know, data logging. Um, what, what are they doing? Let me look at that same map and let me see which ones are, um, you know, currently um, uh, filling with refuse, which ones are um, have just gone to the uh, to the dump. Um, you know, where they are in their routes, um, how many cycles they've done that day, um, things to track productivity of, of machines. Uh, maybe I noticed that, you know, one machine um, has been, uh, uh, you know, much lower productivity today than any day this week. So I, you know, talk with the crew afterwards and, and I discover that they're uh, um, not able to reach the pressures they normally would. So they're not able to compact as well. And so it's hurting their productivity. So sorts of things that help to head off those sorts of issues that may get much worse down the road by having the information immediately available. Remote diagnostics is another big, big, uh, uh, interesting part of telematics. Um, so that same guy that's having pressure issues with his truck, um, maybe I can see that specific issue beforehand. Uh, maybe I can get an alert that says, you know, I've got um, uh, an inability to build enough pressure on this truck on truck 17, um, you know, what can we do about this? And then finally, uh, kind of the, the the highest level of telematics would be remote reprogramming. You know, let's say um, our, our manufacturer or our solutions provider um, came out with an update to the software for our whole fleet of trucks. Uh, they find some bugs in the code or some new features um, you know, we ask them to implement. Well, they can deploy uh, that program out over all 30 of those trucks. Um, the trucks download the program. They wait for the next time they key cycle off and on, and they install the new software. So now all 30 of those trucks the next day when they go out on the road are all running the latest software. I don't have to worry about walking up to each one in the shop, plugging into it with the laptop, downloading. It can all be done automatically behind the scenes with no one else needing to be involved. So what does telematics look like in terms of uh, the physical connection? Um, well, the probably the least common for mobile equipment would be Ethernet. Um, you know, that's obviously very uh, challenging to hardwire a, a machine that's you know in and out of the shop and all around town. Slightly more popular than that would be Wi-Fi. Um, Wi-Fi can be convenient for a machine that returns to a shop each night, um, and you know at that point logs on to its uh, data portal, uploads all of its information from the day. Um, but that doesn't necessarily help um, if I need to, um, you know, figure out what's going on in the field or. Um, you know, if a guy has a problem in the field, I can't, you know, see what's going on in his machine if he's not, you know, within range of a Wi-Fi hotspot. Far and away, the most common would be a cellular connection. Um, I mentioned before about how uh, cellular coverage and, and rates have gotten considerably better um, recently. So we're able to, to share fairly large amounts of data um, throughout the day over a cellular connection. And, uh, um, as well as download uh, program updates over cellular as well. So it's uh, far and away the most popular telematics solution we have in the US. Um, and then for some applications, we get requests for, for satellite telematics. These are more for um, forestry equipment or equipment that is well outside of the range of normal cellular networks. Um, Again, it's fairly rare. We've done a handful of them. Uh, the expense is obviously tremendous, um, but there are some applications that, that absolutely need it. And so that's sort of what um, what we see um, when we implement a, a telematics system in terms of um, you know, the, the, the benefits and the, the implementation. 
So I uh, really want to thank everyone for their time today. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, please share them in the chat. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with you all, and uh, hopefully um, we will uh, talk again soon. Thank you.